Thank you to everyone for attending today. This is the final session in OGEN Summer Law Institute webinar series. I know this is one of my favorite sessions every year at the Summer Law Institute. Um, my name is Louis Philippe. I've been a teacher with the TDSB for 13 years, so starting my 14th year uh, next week. Uh, currently serving as Department Head of Social Science at Bloor Collegiate, uh, where I've taught Canadian international law for the last four years. I'm also a, a member of OGEN's board of directors. Um, so before we start, I just have a few house, housekeeping items to take care of. Um, if you've been attending the last two weeks, you'll be familiar with them. So first off, if there are any links to be shared today, we will post them in the chat. If you have any questions or comments, please use the chat or Q&A function uh, that's available in Zoom. And we'll try to get as many questions answered as we can at the end of the presentation. Uh, and finally, just a reminder that the presentation is being recorded. You'll notice at the top left of the screen. Uh, Ogen will post the video and PowerPoint to the website and the audio to our podcast feed. So we'll be able to follow up that way uh, later. Um, now, before I introduce our speaker today, I'd like to begin with land acknowledgement. Uh, we acknowledge that we are gathered upon the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and Huron Indigenous peoples who are the original nations of this land. In making this acknowledgement, we recall as well that Toronto remains home to a large and diverse Indigenous population. The Canadian legal and education systems are, of course, settler institutions. In Toronto and elsewhere, these institutions can exist and work because of legal covenants between Indigenous and European nations. While we are grateful for the opportunity to live and work in this community, we remain mindful of broken covenants and of the need to work to make things right with all our relations. And I hope in the coming year, we find space in our classrooms and schools to regularly reflect on this reality with our students and colleagues. So as we think about the administration of justice, we're compelled to consider the real impact of institutional injustice on individuals, families, and whole communities. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today to present the top five cases of the past year, as, as I mentioned, always a favorite uh, at the Summer Law Institute. So Professor, uh, Professor Sonia Lawrence uh, joined Osgood's faculty in 2001. Uh, she graduated from the University of Toronto's joint uh, LLB MSW program, went on to serve as law clerk to Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin of the Supreme Court of Canada, and pursued graduate work at Yale Law School. Her work centers on the critical analysis of legal conception of equality. Over the course of her career, she has held a number of service positions at Osgood and York, including Assistant Dean of First Year, Director of Osgood's Graduate Program, Director of the Institute for Feminist Legal Studies, and membership on the York's uh, Senate Executive Committee. She currently serves on the board of the Canadian Association of Law Teachers. Uh, Professor La Lawrence teaches constitutional and public law, as well as a seminar in race and law. So Professor Lawrence, I'll ask you to take it away. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, thanks so much also for the invitation to present to this group today. I really need to add to my bio that I graduated from Warburton Collegiate Institute, which uh, maybe there's someone here from there today. Um, it's really an honor to be able to present um, to high school teachers. I've been thinking a lot about high schools in part because the position of adolescence is a research interest of mine and in part because I have two children in high school this year. I'm so indebted to their high school teachers for the care and compassion and energy and courage that they brought to teaching um, over the last year and a half. Um, my own children are really struggling. I know many children are struggling with the ways that COVID has turned lives upside down, um, led to the loss of loved ones and terrible illness, housing insecurity, economic insecurity. So let me let me really take a minute to thank you all for all of your work and service and to acknowledge how difficult it must be to be teaching under these conditions and how difficult it still is. Um, with a very special shout out to Monsieur Aimon of Ecole Secondaire Toronto West in case he's here because he teaches my daughter so well. Um, everyone should be so lucky. So um, onto the cases I've selected. One of the things you might know about uh, Law, law types is that we're capable of arguing about anything. And so I want to start by noting that my initial reaction to the assignment was, well, what is an important case? What's a top case? Um, and I could easily spend an hour just talking about that. So let me start the screen share. And as you can see, this is, I'm very smooth at this. I'm totally ready for the online year. All right. Okay, 
So what makes a case important? Um, how do we measure the impact or how do we even decide what are important cases? A common complaint about academic law schools is that we spend all our time studying cases from the Supreme Court. And a case decided by an apex court, like the Supreme Court, a court at the top of the system of any particular jurisdiction, is um, not necessarily important just because it comes from that place. So it's not necessarily timely, for instance. There are no cases um, that the Supreme Court have heard, has heard that are about COVID because cases take so much time to work their way up. And yet it's quite clear that there are massively important legal issues to be decided um, uh, on the basis of many different aspects of the way COVID has affected our lives. Um, it's also the case that just because a case is heard at the Supreme Court doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to affect a lot of people. Sometimes the issues are highly um, legally contentious, but relevant to only a few people or to corporations in some very niche area of work. Yet timely and important cases are heard by our lower courts all the time, and they often get ignored by media and by scholars. And even if we're looking at whether lower or higher court cases, we could ask questions about impact by asking, well, how many people are affected and how seriously are they affected? Is there financial loss or gain? What's the size of it? We could ask questions about the moral or ethical importance of the issue being decided. We could ask about the size, somehow try to quantify and the significant change in law. Um, or we could ask about the change in the role or the power of the court or the legislature. That's an area I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, what is the relationship between courts and legislatures? And then we could just ask about how much attention is it getting? And sometimes the attention a case gets might actually make it more important. Um, this last bullet point that I just put up, how many courts follow the decision or are obliged to, obviously goes directly to the question of Supreme Courts. Um, lower courts are obliged to follow the decisions of the Supreme Court, but that doesn't mean that lower court decisions aren't followed. Sometimes lower court decisions are followed because higher courts think that they're good decisions. Um, and then we could also think about the response of our legislators um, to cases and decisions. So sometimes um, the legislation will be passed to erase a particular decision. Sometimes legislation will be changed to comply with a particular decision. So. The last thing I wanted to say on this is that, you know, picking the top cases from the past 12 months now probably will produce a very different list from the cases we might choose if we looked in 20 years. And in some ways, a 20 year vantage point might be a better vantage point to decide which of these really were important and what kind of changes did they make. So this is what we describe in law school as fighting the question. So I started by um, fighting the question and then uh, like any obedient student, I just um, capitulated. So of course there is significance to decisions of higher courts, um, but I just wanted to suggest that there are other ways of thinking about which cases are more important. So the five cases I selected are actually Supreme Court cases. Um, I did put a bonus case on the list that is not, uh, that I'm happy to talk about later. So um, that's just my pitch for, for thinking about the significance of where we look and what we learn when we are um, trying to decide what's important about law and certainly we'll learn very different things if we think that the only thing worth looking at is the Supreme Court. Um, and I have to keep that in mind when teaching my own students because as I said, like law school does tend to really focus on these high court decisions. Okay. So I'm gonna go through the cases that I chose in chronological order. There aren't a ton of links between them. So what you'll see instead is just case by case. And the first one is a case called Fraser versus Canada. So in Fraser, three women um, who were Royal Canadian Mounted Police officers, RCMP officers, um, uh, all had children in the 1990s. So as you can see, like the facts of this case take us way back in time. When they went back to work, they found it very difficult to juggle work with their childcare responsibilities, and the RCMP did not at that time have part-time work. So um, 
they what they did was they took unpaid leave and one of them retired. Later on, the RCMP started to allow job sharing as an option instead of unpaid leave. And these three women all came back to work and engaged in job sharing. Most of the people who took up job sharing were women with children, and most said they did it because otherwise they could not balance work with childcare responsibilities. The, the critical issue in the case was actually about their pensions. So members of the RCMP pay into a pension plan and they get a pension when they retire. So the pension gets bigger the longer they work and the more they earn. Full-time members were allowed to buy back pension um, pension credit if they were suspended from duty, so not allowed to work, or if they took unpaid leave. So they were allowed to use their own funds to buy back pension credits, but the job sharers were not allowed to do that. So they ended up with smaller, um, smaller pensions. Um, so the claim here was that this was a violation of section 15, which is the equality section of the Supreme Court. I've put the text there for you. Um, and the claim was actually a claim based on sex. So the claim was that this affected women um, and was discriminatory. So the big question here was really, is it one, is it discriminatory? And two, is it discriminatory on the basis of sex? And the majority said it was. Um, they said that the pension rules for job sharing were discriminatory because they constituted something called adverse impact discrimination. That is, they were neutral on their face, but they disproportionately affected women with children. And that exacerbated existing disadvantages because it ended up reproducing pay inequities and workplace inequalities faced by women. Um, which include a kind of long-term um, statistical clarity on the question of pension inequality for, for women in Canada. So in this case, the pension plan or the refusal to allow job sharing participants to buy back pensions was, um, was a breach of the equality requirement because it disadvantaged women more than men. And it didn't matter that the plan did not set out to hurt women in particular. What matters in adverse effect uh, discrimination is its effect. So um, the dissenting judges said the RCMP didn't cause this work and family problem. This is Justice Brown and Justice Malcolm Rowe. They said that job sharing was an actually an attempt to help women with children. Um, and just because it didn't completely erase the disadvantage of having to deal with childcare, um, and just because it didn't remove that discrimination, uh, that disadvantage doesn't mean it was discriminatory. They would have dismissed the appeal. Justice Suzanne Cote argued that the discrimination here was not on the basis of sex. She said in her dissent that the distinction is actually a distinction based on caregiving status. And uh, as you can see from the text of Section 15, caregiving status isn't a listed ground and it wasn't really argued as an analogous ground. So um, she would have dismissed the case as well. So when thinking about what you might, um, what we might take from this case, um, one of the things is just the usual section 15 is a substantive, not a formal equality promise. And what that means is just because uh, laws or um, policies set by the state don't um, appear on their face to draw a distinction on the basis of prohibited grounds doesn't mean that uh, they won't be found to be discriminatory. Adverse impact discrimination really focuses on outcomes um, and that uh, one of the things that that means is that you don't have to prove the causation as much. Instead, evidence of the impact will be enough. So that's important because causation is often really difficult to illustrate. The idea here is that the state is responsible for remedying discrimination and inequality, not just for not causing it. And this obviously expands the role we can see the state playing 
And the, in the dissent, the concern was this would be impossible for the state to do, and the RCMP maybe wouldn't even have tried job sharing if they'd realized that that would actually get them into this kind of trouble. So um, just to point out again that the charter is raised in this case, it sounds like the RCMP is not just an employer, right? The RCMP is part of the state. So this wouldn't apply necessarily in this way to regular employers, but it does apply to those that are covered by the charter. And then I guess the last, the two other things that you can see from this case is very sharp decision, divisions between the judges of the court. And, they, and I think it's important to point out that this case doesn't create any kind of income or pension equality other than within this very small workplace of the RCMP. So it really doesn't illustrate, even though it produced a lot of excitement amongst equality scholars because it was such a strong defense of a, um, of a of a strong, thick version of equality, it doesn't actually illustrate a route to a broader kind of equality of income, treatment, or access for all Canadians. So, but this is definitely one of the most important cases of the year if what we're looking at is how much media attention it got. Um, and it may also be of interest because it involves a police force, which was on our minds in other legal ways, in terms of lots of conversations about the problems of policing. Um, and there's an interesting juxtaposition of, of kind of two potentially progressive positions and also the conservative positions on what exactly is it we want from our police and what do we think we owe them. Okay, the second case I chose very deliberately, and I am a, a public and constitutional law scholar, and as a result, um, almost all of the cases that I'm really interested in are in the area of public and constitutional law. Um, and in 2020, 70% of the caseload of the Supreme Court of Canada was in the area of either criminal or constitutional law. Um, so there are very few cases that come out of the Supreme Court that are disputes between two private citizens rather than disputes between people in the state. Most, most of the cases are actually in the area of criminal law, and that's because of rules about who's allowed to appeal to the Supreme Court. But even beyond that, they are mostly public and administrative law type cases. So this case is different, and I picked it in part because of that. Um, so the facts of this case are uh, stem from the 2008 listeriosis outbreak that was caused by contamination in a Maple Leaf Foods plant that's located in Toronto. Um, you may recall 23 people died from eating contaminated meat and many people um, were hospitalized and, and became seriously ill. But this case is not about the people who died or became ill. Those people did sue and they did get a very large um, settlement. This case is different. It's a class action, which is another reason I selected it. When a large group of people, um, as you may already know, when a large group of people have the same legal problem, they can get together and sue as a group. So the class is a group. The action is the lawsuit. Um, in this case, uh, the name of the case, let me just go back, as you can see, is 1688782 Ontario, Inc. So that is the Mr. Sub franchise, the legal name of the Mr. Sub franchise, who was the representative claimant in this case. So franchise owners pay money and sign contracts for the right to operate under the Mr. Sub name. Um, Maple Leaf was the exclusive supplier of meats for Mr. Sub, and when the outbreak happened and the meats were recalled, Mr. Sub franchisees were not allowed to buy from other um, suppliers. They had contracts which said that they couldn't. So eventually the franchisor allowed them to do so, but, it, but there was this period during which um, they lost business and they lost um, reputationally. No one actually got sick from eating um, contaminated meat from a Mr. Sub. So what they're trying to do in this case is sue Maple Leaf in tort, saying that it was Maple Leaf's negligence that caused them that economic loss and reputational damage. For a tort claim to be successful, the plaintiff has to show that the defendant, Maple Leaf, is related to them in some way that means Maple Leaf owes a legal duty of care. Okay, so the question in this case was, does Maple Leaf owe the Mr. Sub uh, franchisees a duty of care 
to prevent economic loss. And the court decided that they didn't. So this case posed a difficulty because the damages were pure economic loss. They weren't damages for, for damage to a human person or damage to property. Instead, it was just pure loss of money. And there are really three ways that the court thought a duty could be owed um, through to uh, prevent economic loss. And one was if there's a contract between them, but actually there was no contract between Maple Leaf and these Mr. Sub franchisees. The Maple Leaf, the Mr. Sub franchisees had contracted with the main Mr. Sub franchisor, that's it. So contracts, um, Maple Leaf didn't have a contract with any of the shop owners saying it had to supply meat to them. So that means that route was out. Um, and then the shop owners tried to argue that Maple Leaf had a duty to them because it was supposed to supply meat that was fit to eat. But what happened here is that the court says, well, yes, Maple Leaf has a duty to protect customers from getting sick, but they don't have a duty to protect the shop owners' business interests. Instead, um, they only had to tell the Mr. Sub franchisees, which they did, that the meat needed to be recalled. So th the franchisees were unable to successfully sue. So there you go, there's the private law case. It's a case in tort, it references contracts, um, and it's about whether or not um, Maple Leaf owes a duty for the loss of money and business reputation to these Mr. Sub franchisees. So in fact, the decision was a five to four decision. So it might be, um, this might be a good case to kind of debate on the issue because it seems quite clear that it's, it's legitimately contentious even amongst the judges. But I think it's also really interesting in terms of thinking about class actions and um, introducing the idea of class actions and thinking about whether or not class actions improve access to justice. Um, in particular, you know, Mr. S franchisees are known to have extremely limited economic power as compared to the franchisor and there are lots of different laws Laws and also critiques about the ways that contract law in particular um, really leaves franchisees very unprotected because of their relative powerlessness. And I also thought that, you know, um, there could be some discussion about the fact that most of the places we, many, many of the food places we purchase our stuff from, Tim Hortons, Mr. Sub, etc. These are franchises and um, sometimes that's not fully understood and it might be an interesting way of talking about the way that businesses are legally organized in this um, province. So that was my foray into private law. The next case I selected is a very obvious one. This one probably is the most important case of the last 12 months. Um, and it is popularly known as the uh, carbon tax reference, but properly known as the References Re Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act. So this case started um, when three provinces, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario, uh, challenged the constitutionality of that act. The act was passed in 2018, and it was passed to um, meet Canada's international commitments on climate change, which had been recently agreed to in Paris. So it imposed a charge on both producers and distributors of any carbon-based fuels, and that became popularly known as a carbon tax, although calling it a tax probably produced more confusion than clarity, and I don't recommend it. Um, the federal government said in the law, so actually in the preamble to the law, um, the federal government recognized that the absence of greenhouse gas emissions pricing in some provinces and the lack of stringency on those issues in some um, pricing systems in other provinces could contribute to significant deleterious effects on the environment, including biological diversity, human health, safety, and economic prosperity. So recognizing that each province's decision about this issue um, would have a broad impact. The law required provinces and territories to implement um, to implement carbon gas pricing systems by January 2019 or have them imposed by this particular act. Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario did not like this idea 
Um, the Ford government had already just recently repealed Ontario's Cap and Trade Act, which regulated greenhouse gas emissions, and they had absolutely no intention of replacing it with a new act. So the case, the actual issue in the case is um, about constitutional jurisdiction. So as you know, jurisdiction or the power to make law over matters is divided in our system between federal and provincial governments by section 91 and 92 of the Constitution Act 1867. The three provinces challenging this law argued that the, the law was outside the jurisdiction of the federal government because it dealt with natural resources, and those are under the distinction of the provinces. But the federal government argued that the opening words of Section 91, which give the federal government power to enact laws for the, quote, peace, order, and good government of Canada, made the GGPPA constitutional. So previous Supreme Court cases had already held that matters of emergency and matters of, quote, national concern could allow the federal government to legislate on matters that would transcend provincial boundaries, but were otherwise actually in provincial jurisdiction. So the majority sets out the test for national concern. Um, and they say, you know, first you have to um, establish that the matter is of sufficient concern to the country as a whole. It's not just something local. It has to be a matter that can't be chopped up and distributed. It has to have this kind of indivisibility to it. And finally, the effect on provincial jurisdiction has to be reconcilable with the fact that we have a division of powers in our Constitution. And the court found that regulating greenhouse gases to combat climate change, so that's the narrow issue, regulating greenhouse gases to, gases to combat climate change is a matter of significant national and international concern. And what the law actually does was establish minimum national standards for greenhouse gas emissions pricing. And obviously, any individual province cannot set minimum national standards. Okay, so three, three judges did disagree, but they all had different reasons for disagreeing. Um, but one of the things that might be most interesting about this case is uh, the statement of the court um, about climate change and its seriousness, which appears very early in the case, um, and where the court really, I think, and this was picked up in a lot of the media about this case, um, where the court really tries to just set down in stone that there's no debate here no debate about the significance and seriousness of climate change, uh, nor whether or not it's real and how it's caused, right? So I've given you that quote there and, and it's in paragraph two. Um, and the case is significant in part because we don't get a lot of these decisions. They come up about once a decade. And so we often don't really know what's going to happen in the next case. Um, you know, one of the ways that I was thinking about which of the last year's cases are important is, am I actually going to change my syllabus to include them? And this one is a no brainer. We absolutely need to be looking at this case in terms of thinking about, well, what are the implications for uh, our division of powers situation in Canada of a case like this, which gives jurisdiction over greenhouse gas emissions pricing to the federal government in order that they can set a minimum national standard, right? And one question that we might ask if we were thinking about this would be, what about the current pandemic, right? So it, like greenhouse gases, like some of the other things that have fallen under this, Pandemics might be a great example of something that provinces can't really say, well, we're just going to deal with what is happening inside our borders because they really transcend that. As you may know, like the power to, to um, legislate over health does go to the provinces. And, and one of the results of that is we see really interesting differences between the ways provinces are dealing with the pandemic. But what this power, the POG power, peace order and good government suggests is that, you know, there could be other ways to do this. And, and uh, as the pandemic continues to develop, we might see um, legally contentious decisions um, in that area as well. Okay. So the next case is called Disotel. Um, and this one starts way back in 2010. 
um, when Richard de Sotel, who is in the middle of the picture there, shot an elk in British Columbia. Um, and the place where it's also in the picture there, the place is the Arrow Lakes, which are in the kind of southern um, east corner of British Columbia, right by the border with the US. So Mr. Disotel did not have a hunting license, so he was charged under the BC uh, Wildlife Act, and he it, there was an additional charge because he wasn't actually a resident, uh, a resident of British Columbia. He in fact is a member of the Colville Federated Tribes, the Lake Tribe, um, and these are indigenous groups from south of the border, just south, but south. So um, he claimed that he had an Aboriginal right citing Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982. So the, the, um, these cases about hunting rights under Section 35 are relatively common since the first one, R versus Sparrow, but this is the first case in which there was a claimant who is not from Canada and um, in fact the group claiming the right uh, the Sinex people are also, Sinaiq, sorry, people are, are, are located physically in the United States. Um, De Sotel argued that the Lake Triber are the descendants of the Sinaiq people, a people who were declared, quote, extinct in Canada in 1956. So this is the first case in which a group claims Section 35 rights in Canada from outside of Canada. And a lot of the argument of the province was that he couldn't possibly have such a right um, because he didn't live within the boundaries of, of Canada. But the majority found that because the purpose of Section 35, and this has been stated in many previous cases, um, because the purpose was to recognize the prior occupation of Canada by um, autonomous, independently um, governed Indigenous societies, treating the current location of the Sinai people as a barrier to a Section 35 claim would be inappropriate. So the Aboriginal peoples of Canada, as described in Section 35, includes the modern day successors of groups that occupied Canadian territory at the time of European contact. And it's very clear that the Sinai people had a yearly round, which included from the south to the north of the territory around the Arrow Lakes. Um, and the majority reason that excluding groups from Section 35 rights because they moved under conditions affected by colonization would simply reproduce the harms of colonialism. So um, the declaration of the Canadian government in 1956 um, that the Sinaiqs were extinct when the main group had settled in the southern part of their territory and the last remaining members permanently living north of the border passed away was irrelevant, right? The court, um, so the government had at that point taken away the Sinai Reserve that existed in Canada, but the court, the Supreme Court said that's really not relevant to Mr. Desotel's claim for an Aboriginal right under Section 35 to hunt elk for food and ceremonial purposes around the Arrow Lakes as the Sinai people did at the time of contact with Europeans. So that was, it was established that um, the Sinai people had hunted elk in that area um, for food and ceremonial purposes. And the evidence of that came from accounts of early Europeans in the region from Sinai oral tradition and Sinai law. And they continued to do this for some time, although the tradition had not been kept up continuously. So this case also, um, sorry about this. Uh, this case got a lot of media attention. Um, so you may well have heard about it already. Um, I think uh, it represents an important um, further piece of uh, the Section 35 jurisprudence, particularly on the meaning of Aboriginal peoples in Canada and on the continuity requirement. Um, I think one of the things that the province argued was that 
such a case would actually create some kind of right to cross the border. And one of the things you can see in the case itself is the court continuously narrowing the claim and saying, we don't need to argue about whether or not Mr. Disotel has a right to cross the border or not, because that's not at issue in this case. At issue in this case is whether or not he had the right to hunt that particular elk for food and ceremonial purposes. So what comes in this case is not a right to cross the border. The court expressly sets that to the side. Um, and there were other similar kind of what ifs and problems raised by the provinces in their arguments. So what about the duty to consult with um, indigenous groups where rights might be affected by government policy? Um, does the duty to consult cross the border? And the court said, we're not going to answer that because it's not raised on the facts of these, this case. Um, it also, um, the court also distinguished an earlier case from Ontario, which might be of interest to some people, um, maybe if you are teaching around the area. So in Mitchell, Grand Chief uh, Michael Mitchell, an Aquasasne Mohawk chief, um, claimed an Aboriginal right to cross the border into the U.S. and back freely. And as you may know, um, Aquasasne actually does uh, straddle the border. Um, that claim was denied by the court on, on a variety of different grounds, with some judges really concerned about the idea of sovereign incompatibility. That is, for modern states, the ability to control the border is, a, is almost a, a fundamental part of what it means to be a state. And Section 35 rights, said the court in, in Mitchell, cannot remove that power. But the court, as I said, in Desotel just says uh, there's no argument being made in this case about a right to cross the border. The argument is about the right to hunt elk. And on that one, um, he prevailed. Um, so you could use this case, I think, to think about how history matters in, in law, or you could use it to think about borders. Um, I think this case is actually really interesting, even though it's a relatively small accretion to Section 35 jurisprudence. This is, am I already at the last case? I haven't been talking to people all summer, so I'm, I'm even though you're, I can't even really see you, I'm just very excited and talking too quickly. Um, all right, so the last case I selected, and I really struggled over this one, but in the end I've selected um, Chuhan, which uh, is a case that started in September, in some ways, in September 2016, when Pardeep Singh Chuhan fatally shot a truck driver, he was also a truck driver, um, in a Toronto parking lot. Um, he was convicted um, of first degree murder in 2019, but on the same day, that he was supposed to pass, um, he and his lawyer were supposed to start choosing a jury. Um, an amendment to the law about um, uh, the process of choosing juries came into effect. And part of that amendment was that there were to be no more peremptory challenges um, by either the defense or the prosecution. So peremptory challenges are when either defense or prosecution decides that they're going to um, reject a potential juror and they do not need to give any reasons, right? So um, Chuhan appealed the con his conviction, he was convicted, um, arguing that the guarantee uh, that in, in section 11F for a fair trial um, by jury uh, had been breached in his case and he, he also said that because his trial had, quote, already started, he shouldn't have been subject to the new measures. So just to go back a little bit, the reason that peremptory challenges were eliminated in 2018 was, um, was it was something that had been debated for a long time, but it was significantly connected to the perceived injustice of Gerald Stanley's acquittal by an all-white jury um, when he was standing trial for the murder of Colton Bushi, um, an Indigenous youth. So you may well know quite a bit about that particular case. Um, and if not, I, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about it. But um, in fact, Indigenous groups have been calling for the elimination of automatic jury disqualifications for years on the basis that um, that was regularly producing all white juries in cases where Indigenous people were either the accused or the victim. 
Um, the challenge of what's interesting, though, is that while um, uh, while Aboriginal legal services located in Toronto intervened in the case, arguing that the exclusion of Indigenous jurors through the use of peremptory challenges is a real and persistent problem that has a corrosive impact on the jury process. Many defense lawyers argued that the change were, was not going to fix the problem and might make it worse because defense lawyers also made frequent use of um, uh, peremptory challenges to exclude people to try to get more racialized folks on the jury or to shape juries um, in their own um, uh, to, for their own ends. So, um, and the, for instance, Canadian Association of Black Lawyers intervened on the other side, like at the other side from Aboriginal legal services. So there is a real conflict here over like, what is the right way to try to eliminate this kind of racism inside our system? And as you may know, um, juries have the, a, a significant part of the juror problem or the problem of juries that have very few um, non-white people on them is about the creation of the jury pool. And then what happens once all the called jurors get to court. Um, and so the creation of the jury pool has, is something that has been um, noted for a very long time that Indigenous people are often excluded. Um, and there's a long report from Mr. Justice Yakubuchi, former Supreme Court Justice, about how to try to rectify some of those problems. Um, and then, of course, once you actually get into the courtroom because of other forms of race salience, including the fact that many um, Black and Indigenous folks are working in low-income jobs that they cannot afford to miss, so they're excused from jury service, um, you also end up with, yeah, we can, we can definitely talk a little bit more about um, jury pools. But anyway, there are lots of different reasons that you might end up with skewed jury pools, and then only then do peremptory challenges even come into play. Um, surprising a lot of people, the case was argued in that very same day, the Supreme Court said, the law is fine, there's no breach of section 11, um, 11 F, the government's decision to eliminate peremptory challenges is not a constitutional problem. And then they said reasons would follow. So the reasons did follow. Um, and, you know, what we kind of find, find there is that there were some, there were some um, judges who were very concerned about this, but the majority of the court um, upheld the law, so upheld Parliament's decision to uh, eliminate these peremptory challenges. But I think there's a lot that you could discuss in this case uh, around, um, in particular, I think, different views from defense lawyers who work with racialized communities and are from racialized communities about whether or not peremptory challenges help or harm um, uh, in terms of racism in, in, the, in jury trials. Um, okay, so those are actually, these are the five cases that I selected in discussion with my excellent RA, Abigail March. Um, and I hope that they're useful. I just have a, like a couple more thoughts about what we might, um, how you might also be able to further discuss these cases. And we can think about the way that court decisions, it's okay, Luis, you should come back, um, kind of can change outcomes for individual people. So obviously, Mr. Chuhan was trying to um, uh, get his conviction overturned, and that didn't work, whereas Mr. Desotel was trying to get his conviction overturned, and that did work. Um, but they might also change future behavior. Um, and we can think about uh, the way a case like Fraser would affect the way the RCMP makes decisions about um, how they deal with their employees in the future. And it would also affect many, many organizations beyond just the RCMP, right? Anybody, any organization um, that's subject to the charter would have to pay attention to a case like that. And then finally, all, uh, many of these cases really deal with the proper relationship between courts and Democrats government. So to when, when is the court willing to say that the government took a decision that was wrong? And the court, this unelected group of nine, is prepared to tell them that it has to be called back. And that's another way of kind of reading a case like Chuhan is that 
it was a duly passed amendment to the criminal code. And it, maybe it would have taken a lot for the court to say that such an amendment was unconstitutional. All right, so here's my list of the cases. It was Fraser, um, Maple Leaf Foods, we won't call it 1688782, uh, the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act, this hotel in Chuhan, and here's the one that I'm offering as a bonus, whoops, which is um, Turtle. Um, and that's a lower court case that I, I really hesitated because I really wanted to put this on. It's from the lowest possible uh, level of court in Ontario. It's a case that was heard in Kenora, um, and it's very interesting case. And when you get the PowerPoints, you can use the link there to go and read it. Um, but I think it offers us a lot of things to, to think about. Okay, so Luis, thank you. Thank you, Professor Lawrence. I'm going to turn to the questions and we have a couple questions in the Q&A and one in the chat. Um, I think I'll just read them and then pose them to you. Yep. Uh, first one is from Nat, a uh, question for later. So does the outcome of this appeal, and I, I'm not sure which case it is in reference to, make it difficult to successfully argue caregiving status as an analogous ground oh, in okay. the future? Yeah, so that must be Fraser. So great question. Yeah. I don't think it does make it more difficult. Um, I think the difficulties are already there, um, but no. And, and you know, one of the interesting things is that family status, which usually refers to something like, are people married or are they common law? Family status already is an analogous ground. Not sure that it does make it more difficult to argue caregiving status ought to be an analogous ground. So uh, the court did not make pronouncements on that. And that's kind of related to what I was saying about De Sotel that ordinarily the court is quite careful not to answer questions it doesn't have to. Um, and that's for a whole variety of reasons, including they may not have been fully argued. And the court is claiming that they you know, rely on advocates to bring good arguments. So I think we could go back. I think I think we could imagine that there could be future cases on caregiving status. And um, in the human rights area in particular, there are cases on caregiving status and, and um, the way employers should deal with caregiving status. So parents of young children, mostly to do with shift work at the border. So great question though. Okay, we have a second question asking if you're aware of other decisions from courts outside of Canada that address Indigenous rights claims that cross national borders. Oh, that's a really good question. I'm not aware. Um, I feel, uh, so, I'm not aware, but, you know, one of the interesting things to think about here is that um, Indigenous rights jurisprudence in Canada through Section 35 is a very particular form of jurisprudence and lots of countries uh, don't have that kind of recognition. They may, so the United States is a good example, they may re recognize particular rights of what are called in the US the tribes in different ways, but um, I am sure that at the international level, and in reality, there will be many, many, many such cases that cross international borders. Whether or not they're formal legal cases will really depend on whether or not there's any avenue to bring the case. So as you know, you know, for example, the Musqueam, who, who were the people at issue in the first Section 35 case, had been fighting um, about their right both to territory and to um, fishing salmon in the Fraser for over a hundred years before they actually made it to the Supreme Court with a claim under Section 35. So I think the answer to your question is I don't know of any formal cases, but there's absolutely no doubt because of the way that colonial borders were were drawn um, in many parts of the world, including uh, Africa in particular, that there must be other cases of this kind. Um, but if there are no recognized rights at all, there's really, you know, it's a totally different kind of playing field, I guess. But I'm happy to look into it. It's a good question. Um, there was a question about jury pool creation, but I think it's been maybe addressed by one of the resources posted in the chat. If not, we can follow up with that. Yeah. Um, a, a new question, uh, would this, this hotel have been able to use uh, UN Declaration of Indigenous uh, Peoples to support his case along with Section 35 of the Charter since Canada has now decided 
to implement UNDR IP? Yeah, so that's also a great question. And I think, um, so, I suspect that the most obvious way that UNDRIP would be relevant here is that the Supreme Court has um, been open to the idea that section um, that our our Constitution should be interpreted with an eye to international commitments. Um, but UNDRIP does have some just justiciability issues like it's not exactly clear what the Canadian government meant when it said it was implementing UNDRIP and as you may know jurisdiction over uh, natural resources and hunting is with the provinces um, and I I think that the answer is probably it lurks there in the background but it probably was unnecessary in this case the the logic of uh, the logic of this case follows um, the logic that was developed back in 1985 with Sparrow, it doesn't look like they actually, 1995, doesn't look like they actually needed more in order to support um, Mr. Desotel's claim and the cl claim of the Sinaiq's descendants. Yeah, I think that's my answer. Okay, next question. Do you have a sense of whether the balance of power between courts and parliament has tended to lean one way or another uh, recently? Yeah, so that's like the big question. Um, uh, and um, maybe the best way of answering it is to say, normally I, I think that it's helpful to think about different kinds of cases and where the court is displaying what I might call a more kind of muscular approach to its role and, and where the court is, um, is is kind of stepping back and being what we call deferential to the government. And it's common for the court to display a, mus a much more muscular approach in criminal cases that engage the charter, um, in part because they see these cases as clearly in their wheelhouse of expertise. This is law, it's criminal law, like judges have always done this and it's fine for us to do this. Um, where they tend to step back are cases about social policy or what they decide is social policy. I think it's all social policy, but they will tend to, to feel more discomfort in cases, let's say, um, about um, laws about I don't know, pollution regulation or uh, in the way that the RCMP deals with its employees. So so mostly I think you have to, you, you can't really take to an, a quantitative approach to that question, which is a really important question. Um, right now, I, I would, the Canadian courts have long tried to like walk the middle line very carefully. As you know, our Chief Justice, um, relatively recently, uh, we have a new Chief Justice, uh, Justice Wagner, and the judges are very careful to try to maintain their institutional legitimacy by, by saying that all they do is interpret the law. That's just their job to apply it as it's written and it's there's nothing they can do about that. But in some of these cases, you can really see debates about whether the court is going too far. And that's clearly visible in Fraser. Um, both Justices Brown and, and Roe are almost, you know, like Supreme Court cases tend to be a bit dry, but the language in that case is quite spiky between the... Um, dissent and the majority and they the dissent is definitely saying you are invading a zone that is not correct for courts to invade whereas justice abella and kirk sanis and the rest of the majority are saying the uh, the guarantee in the charter is um for equality and sometimes that means that uh, governments are going to be required to positively act so it's a great question, but my sense would be that the Canadian court continues to kind of walk a middle line and it doesn't look like they've gotten particularly more muscular, although section 35 might be an area of interest to look at there too, indigenous rights. Um, because there was a sense a few years ago that the court was really um, finding against the government more frequently. Um, and that's an interesting thing to pursue as well, because that might be true, but 
But Section 35, um, while it can have really significant impacts for particular communities in respect of particular rights, does not appear to have had a radical impact on the more general situation of Indigenous communities in Canada. I hope that's responsive. Yeah, we have three more questions, in it, and I might start with the uh, turtle case. There's a question, if you could briefly summarize the RV turtle, so we can call this uh, case 5B. Okay, case 5B. So, so turtle is a case um, that uh, involves five women from Pecanticum uh, Reserve, which is up in uh, the very northwest uh, part of the province. And they're actually, the community is actually part of Treaty 5, um, most of which is in um, Manitoba. So five women from uh, Pekanjikum were charged with uh, drink driving offenses. They were um, ordinarily for these kinds of offenses, you would be allowed something called intermittent sentence, which involves people basically driving to the jail on weekends and um, and staying in the jail on weekends and serving their sentence that way so that they can keep their employment and you know, other things, family life, maybe. Pekanjikum is um, not even, you can't even get to Kenora where the nearest jail is um, driving. And if you, if you, well, you'd have to drive your own car for one, which most of these women didn't have. And I think it's something like 11 hours uh, of driving. So it's not feasible for these women to um, serve their sentence intermittently. Um, but the other thing was they were all caregivers of young children. Many were caring for, a, a, you know, more than two. Um, many were caring for children of other family members who could not care for their own children. And it would have been enormously disruptive for these women to serve the sentence um, in Kenora, right, intermittently or not. It was obviously going to have a massive impact. And so the judge was basically looking for a way out of, of this. And... Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it there in terms of kind of what the what the facts were. But what's interesting about it is that that the crown was desperately trying to make the court the case go away. They tried to make individual um, arrangements with the five different defendants in the case. Um, the judge later told them off for doing that. Um, and the, the, the facts of the case that became important included a lot about the history of the particular place, Pekanjikum. Um, the history of Treaty 5 and the responsibility of Ontario to be discussing um, these issues with Pekanjikum and with the rest of the Anishinaabe Aski Nation um, to come up with solutions for this problem. Because in particular, Treaty 5 actually had provisions about the government um, assisting keeping alcohol off the reserve, for one. Um, but also there was discussion about the, the, um, the incredibly deleterious effects on the community as a whole of um, putting people in that Kenora jail, which is also um, notoriously overcrowded and in poor condition. So um, it's an interesting case. I find it an interesting case um, because it is from such a small place and yet it's a big case. Um, there isn't even a courthouse in Pekanjikum. They actually hear the cases in the hotel and if it's really of great interest, um, they do it sometimes, I think somebody told me, like in the restaurant. So I think it's interesting for us to think about it, especially if we're living in and teaching in urban areas. It's also interesting with respect to um, Indigenous self-governance and the impact of the Canadian criminal justice system in um, remote, rural and Indigenous communities. So I hope that's enough of a taster about turtle and why I think it's important. It probably will never get appealed, right? Because the turtle defendants um, succeeded in the case and the government is not appealing it. The time has already passed, so you're not going to see it again. But what you might see is negotiations between the Ontario government, Pekanjikum, and maybe Anishinaabe Aski Nation about, at the very least, um, more access to community-based sentencing for folks who live in reserves like this and 
um, at most maybe um, indigenous led uh, responses to offenses like drunk driving. I don't know if that's responsive enough. I think Louise is frozen, which might mean that I'm frozen too, but I'll just say like if anybody's interested in more on turtle, I have a short article on it and I'm happy to, to send that out as well. Hi, I'm just jumping on because I do think we lost Lewis and sorry about this. You can hear my air conditioner <laughs> to my right. Um, I just wanted to say on, on this note, um, we have two more quick questions uh, in chat um, about whether the, uh, the um, in, in Des Hotel, this is likely to affect international jurisprudence. Um, but I, I am also cognizant of, of time and it being a little bit after two. Um, it looks like if, if you are able to share your article on Turtle, um, maybe that's something that we can, we're going to email out a request for feedback to everybody after this session. We can attach that article to that so that everybody gets a copy. And we also will be posting all of these webinars after the fact. And so we'll make sure that that article is included there as well. Lewis, you've managed to get back in. Yeah, sorry about that. I got kicked out for a second there. No worries. I was I was just starting to to wrap up. Um, Christy, you might want to do the the uh, concluding screen share. Thank you to Professor Lawrence for an excellent presentation. I think we had a couple of questions to left, which is probably a sign of how engaging and interested people were in in what you presented today. Uh, thank you for everyone for attending today and and for attending the uh, Summer Law Institute webinar series. Uh, a reminder that today at 5 p.m. Uh, there's going to be an um, opportunity to reconvene for the Hux Kitley Exemplary Educator Award Ceremony. Uh, this year's honoree will be Kim Wilson, uh, who is an incredible educator from Halton Region. So if you'd like to join us, please email um, Awards Pre. I think the email is going to be put in the, uh, the chat for you and let them know so that, so that uh, they can send you the link to attend. Um, we'll be dropping the survey in the chat momentarily, uh, but also emailing it out to to attendees. So please take a moment to let us know what you thought of the session. And we'd also like to thank the Law Foundation of Ontario, who is one of our core funders. Uh, the LFO support makes the Summer Law Institute and everything else we do possible. So thank you once again to Professor Lawrence and everyone for attending on a very warm Thursday. <laughs>